Hey, welcome back to my channel. It's Jacqueline or Galacticat, and today we're going to be following on from last week when we drew a dog using the grid method. So if you haven't seen that video, I will link it somewhere above. I don't know what direction it's going to be. In. It's going to be somewhere up there. So click that link if you haven't seen it. We learned how to draw the beautiful miniature dash hound called Bailey. She belongs to my friend Lauren and she's absolutely adorable. I'll link the reference photo in this video as well. So you can go check that out if you would like to use that photo. But if you're using your own, then please grab that link and show me anyway, because I would love to see your photos or your paintings in the comments. So today we're going to be doing it in watercolor. You can use whichever medium you want, but um, I'll be teaching you the processes of how I do my dogs in watercolor and cats and any animals. Really, it's the same process, it's just a whole bunch of layering, but I will show you the exact process, how I mix my paints and what tools you'll need. So let's jump into that and yeah, have fun. <laughs> So let's go through what you'll need. So you'll need your drawing from last week. Mine might look a little bit different because I decided to redo it on a different type of paper. I'll get into that in a second. You'll need two pieces of paper towel or as much as you need. You need your brushes. I use a different variety of sizes from Derwent, Princeton and Windsor and Newton. I use Senlier watercolors. So you'll need any watercolor that you feel comfortable using. I also use the Windsor & Newton Cotman's range. I just put a glob of it on this plate here, let it dry and reactivate it as I need it. You'll need a scrap piece of paper. This can come in handy for testing colours. you need two glasses of water, one for clean and one for dirty water. Here's the paper that I am using. Last week I used the Arches Watercolour Smooth and today I'll be using the Aralo Di Paolo Medium Tooth. It's also useful if you have a hairdryer on hand because that can speed up the drying time. Let's get our reference photos ready. I've duplicated the original one and I'm going to edit it so it's in black and white. This will help you see the values without confusing your brain about the colour that it needs to be. Then pop on some music or a podcast. I like listening to the Egyptian History podcast. And let's start painting. I'm starting off with my biggest brush and I'm going to mix up some colour that is the lightest value of what I can see in my reference photo. I'm using a pre-made colour here, but you can mix these colours using just the primary ones. I'll leave a link in the description box below to a free course on colour theory by Emma Witt. Basically, you're going to water down that colour until you have a nice sheer wash to go over your painting with. We're going to start really, really light and then gradually build up as we go. So it doesn't matter if you think that it's too light because you're going to need it in your highlighted areas anyway. We're going to add a light wash over the top of our pencil drawing. And I tend to make a kind of gradient in the places that I know need highlights later. So you can see me doing that here and making the nose a little bit darker, the head a little bit darker, but I'm keeping the sides of the face and above the eyebrows relatively light. Again, don't worry too much about saturation here because we're going to add a lot of that later. This first layer is kind of like when we did our pencil um, kind of sketching to show where the dark and the light will be. So you're just kind of going to add those parts in with a little touch of darker watercolor. I hope that I'm explaining this okay, but yeah, you just want a really sheer wash to begin with and then you'll layer up a bit later. To create that gradient look, make sure you have a semi-wet brush and kind of wipe it away. Use your paper towel to wipe off the excess off of your brush and then do it again until you're at a level that you're happy with. If you're really, really new to watercolour, I do recommend looking up some watercolour techniques here on YouTube and just having a bit of a play so you can figure out the wet on wet techniques, the wet on dry techniques, how the watercolours blend with each other and what would happen if you have a whole bunch of water um, and you're trying to make a gradient, what would happen if you're trying to make, you know, more of a harsh line. It, yeah, just play around with it, see what happens and then jump into something like this. I will admit it's something that I didn't really do as a beginner and I think it's a valuable thing to know and to learn and also your colour theory. So head to that link that I left in the description box and figure out how to mix your colours. 
That way you only need a handful of colours, so red, yellow, blue, uh, maybe some Payne's grey, and you won't have to spend a whole bunch of money. So yeah, learning your colour theory is super important when you're a beginner because you don't want to go all out all at once. So here's where we start to layer up. What I like to do is lay down a bit of color and then go back in with a slightly wet brush and blend it out. And I do this over and over again for all of the sections that need to be slightly darker. Again, I'm doing this from the lightest to the darkest that it needs to be. So blending it out quite a lot and then as I go on, I'll add more and more to build up that level of saturation. Make sure you're always referring back to your reference photos. So use the black and white one so you make sure that you're putting the darker parts where they need to be and keeping the highlights as clear as you can. I tend to struggle with keeping the whites of my paintings white, if that makes sense. So that might be something that you struggle with too. Just know that you're not alone. I still struggle with that and I'm still learning new things all the time. So if you pick up a different skill or a different way of doing things, then go ahead and experiment because that's what art all is all about, experimenting. I kind of went off on a little bit of a tangent there, so let's go back to painting. So as I was saying about the reference photos, make sure you're referring back to both of them. As you can see in the top left corner of my screen, I actually have them side by side. I used Procreate on my iPad to do this, but there are a whole bunch of free apps that you can download from the app store so you can put things side by side. I don't think I mentioned yet about what paper I'm using and why I decided to change my paper. So I'll quickly touch on that now because it is an important thing to uh, consider when you're starting a painting. So in this video, I'm using a medium tooth cold pressed paper. In the first video, I was using a smooth hot pressed paper. The difference is that one of them has a lot of texture. This one, the medium tooth one is the one with a lot of texture, but the one in the last video was very, very smooth. I find that with the smooth paper, I get slippery watercolor. I, I don't know if that makes sense. It's the best way I can describe it, but the watercolor doesn't really hold to the paper. And I find that when I try and layer things, it just slides around and makes things muddy and it, it doesn't have this type of effect that I personally like. Whereas the medium tooth paper, it, it holds the watercolor a lot more. It holds a lot more water. I'm very chaotic when I paint, as you can probably tell from this video. And I feel like the, the smooth paper isn't suited to that type of art style at all. Honestly, this is all going to be down to personal preference. So try out both and see which one you prefer for the style of painting that you would like to do. You might also find that you will start off with one type of paper and eventually you'll try a different one and you'll prefer that one as well. So it doesn't matter. You're always going to change your likes and dislikes. You're always going to pick up new skills and that's fine because you know, you're, you're finding out your style and I'm still finding out my style. I've been doing this for a couple of years now and I'm still finding things that I prefer and what I like to do and how I like to do it. So here in the ear, I kind of felt like I had muddied up the ear a little bit and lost a little bit of the highlight. So I brought in my paper towel that I'd put aside at the start and mopped up a little bit of that excess pigment and water. In this case, I'm just using it to uh, kind of bring back highlights, but it can actually create a really nice texture if you use it on your final wash. So try that out if you want to as well. Another tip that I've found is a complete lifesaver is if you have a magic eraser or you can grab one from somewhere, I highly recommend doing it because if you get little splotches of watercolor on your white sections of your paper, you can use the magic eraser to completely get rid of it. It does kind of affect the texture of the paper, so I wouldn't use it anywhere that you're actually painting. But if you get a little bit of splatter that you don't want on there, then yeah, definitely try that out and it will just it will make it disappear. It's absolutely amazing. I couldn't believe that it worked when I first tried it, but I'm so glad that it does. It's kind of like one of those life hacks that you see on five minute crafts that you think, yeah, that would never work. And it actually totally does. So here I'm just layering again 
and that's you know pretty much what I do the entire video but I'm making sure to put extra attention in those little puppy dog eyes so the little wrinkles and shadows that you see underneath the eyes that's what creates that real puppy puppy dog eye look so again refer back to your black and white photo and make sure that you point out where those shadows are and that will help you get a more you know lifelike painting I said in the last one that I don't do realism and I don't I just like to capture that essence of the dog or the cat and puppy dog eyes and you know the eyes of a cat are something that really stands out to me and something that I really like to you know make a feature in my painting so while it's not exactly realism I do like to emphasize those parts of it I also want to bring special attention to that little wrinkle down its forehead because I think that's super cute and it's definitely a feature of that particular dog. Here you can see me doing a kind of gradient outline. So I get some pigment on my brush and I lay it over a wet section of the painting. So that will make it blend into the rest of the painting while keeping the outside of it relatively dark. I don't do this the whole way around most of the time I do kind of little fur strokes to give it a little bit of texture and to make it look a little bit more fluffy. At this point your painting is going to look kind of crazy and kind of weird and kind of demonic because the way that I paint I usually leave the eyes until very last so it just looks like a hollow dog but um, yeah at this point you're gonna think oh my gosh this looks terrible but honestly keep going and I promise you it does get better as you add more layers. It's just that at this point you've kind of just got a skeleton of a painting and you just have to build up on it. It is a very long process and it can be quite tedious especially when you don't see a payoff right at the beginning. I understand that it can be kind of almost disheartening to look at something that you've been working on for a while and think oh it looks terrible but yeah just keep going with it. I promise you it does get better. So to spare you some boredom, I have sped up the next part of the video because it pretty much is the same process over and over again. And I know that sounds kind of really annoying or boring, but it's quite therapeutic when you're actually doing it for yourself. So yeah, this is in 20 times speed, I think. Uh, all up, this took me about an hour and a half to do. Um, so relatively short when you look at it compared to something like acrylics or oil painting but it's still something that you have to put your time and effort into. So a few times in this section you will see me adding a wash of colour over the top and that just brings everything together. So what I do is very similar to how we did at the start. I take that base colour, I water it down and then I add a very sheer wash of it over the top of those shadows. It just kind of makes it look a whole lot more blended and um, you know like a comprehensive piece of artwork so you've got those shadows underneath that um, that same hue I guess it's a bit hard to explain but kind of think of it as you know the same as what we did at the start except you're just putting it over those shadows and pulling everything together you can also see me adding darker and darker shades of those colours in as well and making those shadows really stand out. So you want to have a look at both of those reference photos. Again, I will keep saying that to you because it's so important and recognising where the shadows would be. So underneath the ears, in the folds of the ears and um, on top of that little nose section there and again in those puppy dog eyes. At this point you can really see it coming together and it's starting to look more like the texture of the dog's fur. This dog is a short haired dog. If you are doing a more textured dog with longer fur then that's a whole different ball game altogether. So this one deals with a lot of blending whereas longer haired dogs has to deal with a lot more brush strokes and defining that fur. But for now we'll just focus on the short haired version. I'm pretty happy with how the fur is looking at this point so it's time to move on to the nose and the eyes to make it look a little less demonic. Now a lot of watercolour artists will say don't use black and don't use white but I say do whatever you want to do and whatever feels right. 
I personally like using black especially for noses. I get the purest black and then I water it down and do exactly how we've been doing the entire time. I lay a base color and then I layer it up as I need to where the shadows are. I left quite a big space for the nose but that's so I can blend up with the rest of the fur so you can see now that I'm bringing that brown down into the nose as well. Generally dogs noses will have the darker shadowy part on the bottom of the nose and the lighter part that sees the sunlight on the top of the nose depending on where your light source is coming from but that's a general rule of thumb. Just remember to always check your reference photos. Are you sick of me saying that yet? Moving on to the eyes, we're going to mix a nice deep brown and again we're going to water it down. Then we'll apply a single layer of that same colour. We're not going to do any fancy gradients here, just a single wash of that colour. And then we'll let it dry and layer up like we have been doing the whole time. With my style, you might notice that I have enlarged the eyes slightly from what they would be on the reference photo. That's just because that's the type of painting that I like to do. I like to emphasize those cute little puppy dog eye features and things like that. Again, I take the essence of the dog and I create it into my own piece. Now, if you remember from last week's video how we kind of left that little shaded section in the eye, well, that's where this is going to come into play now. So I'm going to get a darker version of that brown color that I laid down first, and I'm going to put it directly underneath the eyelid and slightly around the eyeball itself. This is to create the shadow that the eyebrow would have given over the dog's eye. I do skip between the nose and the eyes in this section. That's just so I don't have to use my hair dryer each and every time and I can wait for one section to dry while doing the other section. It's quite handy to work on a few sections at once, especially if they're not touching each other. So you're not gonna get any watercolor contamination. For the bottom part of the eye, I'm taking a really saturated gold color and just adding it to that lower third. This is going to be where the kind of highlight would be and where the most color would be that you'd see. It still looks pretty crazy without the pupils at this point, but we'll get to that in a second. Now here's where you have to remember how the nostrils of a dog work. So they're not like human nostrils that just have two holes in our nose. They kind of hook around and so you have to put that in in your darker colors that there's kind of a line that will connect it to the side of the nose. I recommend looking up some photos on Google of dog noses because it's something that I really struggled with when I was a beginner, trying to get my head around the fact that their noses worked slightly differently to ours. In regards to eyes and noses, a lot of artists will keep the whites of the eyes and nose where the highlights would be, that keep them clear. But because my painting style is quite chaotic, how I've mentioned before, I find that I tend to muddy those up and I can't really visualize where they are until right at the end. It's something that I do want to work on and I do want to practice putting into my art style. It's just the way that I paint at the moment. I it doesn't really work out for me and this particular method is how I feel most comfortable painting eyes and noses. I will get into how to add in those highlights using different mediums in a little bit but for now we have to draw in our pupils. We'll paint in our pupils not draw them in. <laughs> but remember how I was saying with our sketch we left a little bit of a shadow underneath that brow bone. We're gonna follow the same kind of shape that we put in our sketch. So we're gonna have a little circle in the middle and connect it to a kind of shadow right underneath the brow bone. It's gonna be in exactly the same color as each other. So it's gonna look kind of weird to your eye at the moment if you're not used to seeing things like this. You kind of, always picture a pupil as the darkest part and then above the pupil is going to be the eye color. And yet that's true when you're actually looking at someone in, in real life or if you're looking at an animal in real life, you can see that difference. But when you're translating it to a painting or even in a photograph, you can notice it, it will kind of look all the same. So in the case of a brown colored eye, this is how I would do it. I'd use a deeper brown to create those shadows and that pupil. With the blue eye, I would use a deeper blue for the pupil and the shadows. 
At some point during waiting for the eyes and the nose to dry, I will add in the name. So I'm mixing up a nice purple colour and just doing that in a calligraphy style underneath. This part is totally optional of course, but maybe you want to experiment by adding some florals or a wreath or something like that underneath. Go wild, see what comes out. I'm actually terrible at florals. I don't know why, I could just never pick up the technique to do flowers and stuff like that. Leaves are relatively easy, so maybe give those a go first if you're looking into getting into florals. But maybe you've just got that skill, you know? Some people just have it. I don't. <laughs> Now that we're just about finishing up with the eyes, we can start to look into bringing in some highlights. I like to use white acrylic paint or Posca markers. You can also use some white gel pens if you prefer. I also bring in some thin um, like whiskers and details like that with my Sharpie pen. I find that it just has a nicer point and finish than the watercolor. And I go in with the Posca marker for the edge of those little eyes there. I don't always use a Posca marker, but I thought for the purpose of this video, I'll show you guys. So with my acrylic paint, I like to get a little dab of it on the tip of my tiny little brush. And I put like a little L shape, an upside down L shape. Then I get some water and I blend it out, much like what we would do with watercolour, except this is a whole lot more opaque. You can also use gouache for this if you prefer, but that's a lot more transparent than the acrylic and might need a few more layers. I'm not sure if this is the conventional way to add highlights to a watercolour piece, but it's just what works well for me and I think that it creates quite a striking highlight in the eye and I really enjoy how it looks. I also like to add the cute little cartoony dot highlights like you can see me doing here. Again, I do not do realism, I quite enjoy the playfulness that this brings to my pieces. I'll also add some very, very thin, transparent highlights to the eyelid and to the lower waterline. Of course, we can't forget the nose and the fact that dogs' noses are generally always wet. Cats' noses, not so much. They do sometimes have a little bit of a highlight and I still like adding it for emphasis, but they don't have as much wet moistness as dogs noses do so make sure again you look at your reference photo and you pick out where those bright highlights would be and you add them in with your paint at this point so now I'm about to share with you my secret to making the eyes pop I will get some black watercolor on my paintbrush and I'll put a little cross in that L-shaped highlight that we put on first. This kind of makes it look like there might be a window or some kind of reflection in the eyeball and it just it makes it so much more dimensional, I guess. And I just, I love how this looks. I think I had a reference photo where there was actually a window and that's where I got this from. And I've been doing it on my eyes ever since then. At this point, I'm bringing my Posca marker to bring back some highlights that I might have lost during the painting process. I also found that I thought my nose was slightly big for the dog and I used my Posca marker to kind of cinch in that nose a little bit and bring back the highlights that would have been right on the side there. That pretty much brings us to the end of this video and what I can teach you today. So give it a go, head to the link that I mentioned before in the description box and add your own paintings there so I can see what you do. And thank you so much for watching you guys. I'm actually trying a new editing and filming style so I hope that it wasn't too choppy and changey and I hope the audio is still okay for you guys but I'm still figuring it out and hopefully my next couple of videos will be slightly better than this one. But thank you so much for watching. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more like this.